joining us online. Oh, everyone's gone quiet. You're getting better. I am impressed. So I'm just going to leave the meeting today. So welcome, as I've already said. Um, a little bit later on, Ben will be bringing the message. I guess that Roman's doing the praise and worship, and I'm the book end at the beginning and the end of the service. So there you go. Um, I've got something really small to share, and I think that as I was coming into church, even last night I was thinking, I know what I'm going to praise the Lord for today, and consciously praise Him for this particular thing, even though He's done many things in my life. And that is the consistency. He's been there right through my life, right through yeah. when I was at high school, secondary school, as we say over here, junior school, working right back down to the nursery. He's been there all the time, even when I've not known it, I've not realised it. Um, and the reason I thought about that is because we were watching an interview last night, Dermot O'Leary was interviewing Tate Zach, three members at least. And I was saying to Johnny that I grew up with Tate Zach, and then they'd play the songs and I was singing along last night, and he said, I didn't realise you, you like Tate Zach that much. And I said, I, I don't really, but I'm familiar with the songs. and. They saw me through secondary school years and I had a couple of songs and albums and I enjoyed it. But I can remember when they split up, some of the girls at school were genuinely devastated. 1996, Robbie left in 95, scan all of this. <laughs> and uh, one particular friend was really into Take That and she fancied Mark Owen and I'm sure she was quite tearful at the time. But do you know what? They weren't there all the time. They weren't consistent. She was a fan, but she didn't personally know him. And that's how I thought about the consistency of God. And he's never left me. He never will. He's always there through the, the, the hard times, the dark times, the light times, the joyful times. And I'm going to praise him for that specifically this morning. If you can think of something specific this morning, hold it in your heart and give him the praise and glory for it this morning. And to bless him because he's so good at blessing us. Mm -hmm. I think that's all I've got to say. So after Bronwyn, I'm going to let you just come up, Ben. I will let you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you would like to come up, uh, that would be lovely. Okay, then I'm going to hand over to you, Bron. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> Good morning,
Yeah. 
can see you reaching for me this morning. And I want to let you know that I want to be found by you. I'm stretching towards you. I'm embracing you. I want to be found by you this morning. As you seek me, as you turn towards me, you will find me. You will find me. For thee calling unto thee, know this morning that I hear your cry, my child. I see deep within the depths of your spirit, deeper than you can perceive. And know this morning, as you cry out, I am there. I am there to lift you. I am there to encourage you. I am there to bring you up to a higher place, as it were. I am there to hold you when you feel down. I am there when you cry. I will hold you and comfort you. Know that the everlasting arms are around you. I will be that still, small voice. Listen to that still, small voice as you call unto me. I am there. I want to encourage you. I want to show you the way. I have great plans and purposes for your life. Hear me, hear me, listen to that still small voice. For I'm not in the storm and I'm not in the thunder. I'm in that still small voice. That still small voice. Just tune, fine tune your spiritual ear to me this morning. For I have much for you. free church where people can prophesy like that and the Lord can speak like that and encourage us. So you might have seen on social media that the title of the message today is The Bones of Joseph. Now I'm guessing there probably hasn't been a sermon called that, maybe in the world, I don't know. It's a strange title, isn't it? And if you're expecting some kind of archaeological talk, I'm sorry, it's not going to be that, unfortunately. Hopefully something better than that. So the phrase came from a prophecy that our friend Peter Cabana gave here on the 3rd of July last year, 2022. Um, those of you in the meeting will remember it was a powerful prophecy. Obviously it had personal implications for Elisha and I, because that word kind of set in motion us coming here and me taking on the associate leader role here at ALCC. But really, it was a word for the church. Um, it was really powerful, it was sobering. The most impactful prophecy I've heard personally in, in my 15 plus years of walking with Jesus. I'm not going to read the full prophecy, but I'll just read a section of it. Uh, and really, this message comes off the back of a phrase that Peter used in that prophecy. So he said, talking to me, you're going to inherit soon. Some old things that need to stay around, even after the old ones have gone. And by the way, they're Peter's words, not mine. <laughs> not calling anybody old. Uh, take the bones of Joseph on to the next stage. The bones of Joseph. So a bit of context then. This is Joseph from Genesis, of technical a dream of fame, if you're into musical theatre. He was a son of Jacob, and he had brothers who were very jealous of him. He was a bit of a show-off, Joseph, to be fair. Um, a good man, but he, he liked to show off in front of his brothers. And they had enough of it, and they sold him into slavery, and he ended up in Egypt, in well, ultimately in prison. Um, but God exalted him. God was with him, even in that really low point. And God exalted Joseph to actually being the prime minister of the nation under Pharaoh and through kind of dreams that God gave him, he helped that nation navigate a time of famine um, and ultimately brought prosperity to that land. And he was reconciled with his brothers. And so all the Israelites ended up 
in Egypt. You see, that wasn't God's ultimate plan. Because going back to Abraham, God said, the promised land Canaan is going to be where my nation of Israel is going to be. But currently we're in Egypt. And Joseph knew about God's promise to Abraham. He knew that Egypt was just a temporary detour, if you like. That they would be back in Canaan, that land flowing with milk and honey. So in Genesis 50, if you want to turn there, you're welcome. Genesis 50, verses 24 to 25. Joseph's an old man now. He's 110, so that's very old in my book. And he's talking to his brothers, and he says this. I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land, to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear on oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. And 279 years later, and I know that because I've researched it, God miraculously delivered Israel from Egypt, and they ended up back in Canaan. It took them a long time. They wasted 40 years. The unbelief when it would have taken them 40 days actually to make that journey. But Joseph's bones got back in Canaan. Obviously, in, in a manner of speaking, he wasn't fully there, but his bones made it back to where he knew he was meant to be. And actually, in Hebrews 11, Joseph is mentioned as one of the examples of people of faith because he saw beyond his own lifetime, he saw beyond the here and now. And he knew that though I'm in Egypt now, and I can't see how I'm going to get back to Canaan, one day I'm going to be there again. And of course, it came to pass. So that's the story, if you like, that Peter was alluding to in the prophecy. So we're not talking about literal bones here. I understand from that word, the bones of Joseph to refer to this. The indispensable elements of ALCC the essentials, the non-negotiables of what we are and who we are, what we stand for in this church. These are the things that need moving forward into the future. Some less important things perhaps don't need to, but there are non-negotiables. That if we are going to fulfill the call of God in this area, we need to take with us as we go forward. We can't leave them in Egypt. So this leads then to an obvious question. Well, what are the bones of Joseph for us? And I've been given this some prayerful thought for quite a while, really. And I've come down to five. And I'm hoping that when I say these five, there'll be a bit of a yes in your spirit. That, yeah, that is right. That is who we are. I'm hoping so, anyway. If, if not, tell me later. I'm not going to revise them. All right. So in every season of the church, these bones might look a little bit different. But as far as I understand, these have always been present. They are present now, and they need to be present in the future. Otherwise, we're not going to be who God has called us to be. So these are the five values, and we're going to unpack them this morning. Number one, evangelical. Number two, Pentecostal. Number three, missional. Number four, inclusive. And number five, pioneer. Obviously, I'll remind you of those as we go through. And before I jump in, I just want to acknowledge that for some of us here, thinking about the big picture of church is a big task. I'm aware that some people in this room have really complex personal situations. Some people are struggling to get through the week. Some people are struggling to pay the bills. And so I'm saying this sensitively, knowing that you might be thinking, well, that's all well and good, but what about my pressing needs? And so I want to be pastorally sensitive. But I would remind you and myself of the words of Jesus. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. 
So friends, even if you feel hard pressed, keeping your house going, make an effort to build God's house. And I speak that to myself. I know Elisha and I haven't got children presently, but our lives are very regimented and very busy with work. It's just the season of life that we're in. But I'm committed to building God's house in this season. That might look different in this season compared to a future one. But we, I would just suggest that we all kind of put our all in, whatever that looks like for each of us. Because if you build God's house, he will promise to build yours. Amen. That's basically a paraphrase of what Jesus said. So of course, don't neglect your responsibilities at home. God says that's important. Providing for your family is important. Doing the mundane things of life are important. But try and stay on track with this journey that God's got us on here at ALCC. And as I talk about these five values, ask yourself, are these values strong in me? Because if these are the values of the church, and if we're not all embodying them, then we're not going to fulfil the mandate we've been given. We've all got things to work on. We've all, some of these, you think, yeah, that's me. That's what I get really excited about. That's where my gifting is. For all this, it might not be. But if we all just try and move forward together in those areas where we're lacking, we'll be a stronger church. So, I think I've set the scene. Let's begin then, uh, looking at being evangelical. So, evangelical faith has a number of elements. It emphasises the necessity of being born again. The atonement of Christ, the cross of Christ, is central. Activism in spreading the gospel is essential. And evangelical Christians have a very high view of scripture. And that's what I want to focus on here. From day one of this church coming into existence, this church has always believed that the Bible is God's infallible word. That it's our sole authority for all matters of faith and conduct. All matters of belief and behaviour. We go to the scriptures to find out exactly what to believe, how to behave, how to do church. Because we believe the Bible is God's inspired word to us. That over a period of about 1,500 years, God gave revelations to men who wrote them down. He didn't use them like a typewriter, because often their personalities and their cultural backgrounds comes through. But it's God's message. It's his word. The Bible's written by around 40 different people over a period of 1,500 years. But there's a beautiful consistency in its key themes and its key messages. The Bible starts in a garden. It ends in a garden. It's just it's a beautiful woven book. I would expect it to be that, wouldn't we, if we believed it was God's inspired word. So what are some implications then of our evangelical stance as a church? Here are just a couple of thoughts. Tradition can be helpful, but we won't be bound by it. This is the key strength of evangelical churches, that we can constantly reimagine how we do church, how we present the gospel. We don't change the message, of course, but we've got complete liberty to rethink how we do things because we're not bound by traditions of men. Some historic denominations are. They treat tradition as almost being equal with scripture. Well, we've always done it this way. Well, X, Y, and Z says we must do it this way. And of course, there's wisdom in learning from other people, absolutely. But ultimately, unless the Bible says, do it this way, we've got freedom to rethink it. We've got freedom to try something new. That's part of the reason why we are reasonably successful compared to some other churches that are closing down. And we're going to be more successful because of our evangelical stance. Popular culture may change, but we won't bow the knee to it. The United Kingdom, Western civilization, was based on the assumption that the Bible is God's word. And it brought great prosperity to Western civilization. Of course, that isn't the default case 
anymore. We live in a world that calls evil good and good evil. This pressure on Christians to fall in line on certain issues. That if you believe in moral absolutes, you're a bigot. That's kind of the narrative that's out there. But my Bible tells me that God's got eternal standards. That there is no shadow of turning with thee. That the grass withers, the flower fades, for the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. Friends, as ALCC moves forward, we need to take this bone with us. We're not leaving our faith in the word of God behind. And we can see from history and even contemporary events where this happens. In 2021, the Methodist Church made a very liberal decision. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs, but you can research that if you want to. To succumb to the pressure of society rather than the word of God. And that, that's been disastrous for them. Our friends at Pilsley have left Methodist Church. They gave up their building and they meet in the village hall now. And our and I have friends at Watchorn Church in Alfreton, withdrawn from Methodism, gave up, well, I think they bought the building, um, but they weren't willing just to go along with how it was, because it was going in the wrong direction. According to recent studies, the Methodist Church has an R number of 0.85. Do you remember the R number from the pandemic? Basically, if it's bigger than one or one, you're growing. If it's less than one, you're shrinking. And according to statisticians, I said that word correctly. I'm talking in the natural here, because I don't want this to happen. But naturally speaking, the Methodist Church is likely to be extinct in the UK by the mid 2040s. I pray that that doesn't happen, because the Methodist Church has a great history. My great grandmother was a Methodist before she came into the Pentecostal movement. Aunt Elizabeth's family were Methodists, a great and godly heritage. But currently, they're going in the wrong direction. By contrast, churches that are Bible-believing, and particularly those that are Pentecostal, have an R rate of between 1 and 1.1. What that means is we're growing. It means our faith, our brand of faith, if you like, is more contagious. You see, the world is confused. It's mixed up. It wants definitive answers. And as evangelicals, we can take this word and we can say, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says about your situation. And friends, we need to get trained in this word. Yeah. We need to love this word. We need to be saturated in it. Because people are going to come through this door with all kinds of problems. And they don't want your opinion. Even though I'm sure it will be a good and wise opinion. Yeah. They want the truth. Yeah. For it's the truth that sets people free. It's attractive to people when we know what we believe. Some people won't agree with us, but people admire someone who says what they think. I'll talk about this later, but Elisha's cousin, Lewis, I've actually never met him until he came into this church a few weeks ago. Elisha, I've not seen him for years. He came in and went out with him on Friday. And it's been so refreshing to hear, I was preaching that day, hear someone say what they think. He's not yet a Christian. But it's attractive, friends. Let's not tone it down. Amen. But let's say, this is what I believe. This is what the Bible says. People might not always agree, but they will respect you. Rather than saying, oh, well, it could be this, or it could be that, or she said this. What do you say? That's the challenge I would present to us today. Is the Bible a foundation in your life? Do you see it as the book? Or is it just one of many useful books? And I love books, I really do. But if I spend more time in other books than this book, I'm in trouble. But this is the only book with the breath of God in it. God speaks to us through this word. Not necessarily through Netflix or whatever else we spend our time on. It's through the Bible. Can you imagine, church, if there was a revival of reading the Bible in churches in the UK, if we truly love this book as we should. I tell you what, we won't be shaken half as much. We wouldn't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine so much. We'll be fixed. We'll be steadfast. 
We'll be resolute. We'll be on a firm foundation. And like Luther, we could say, my conscience is captive to the word of God. And when that's our stance, no power of hell, no scheme of man can intimidate us. Are we okay so far? Yeah. All right. The second bone, if you like, and our second value as a church, Pentecostal. So this church started in 1939, and from day one, it was a Pentecostal church affiliated with the Assemblies of God in particular. <clears throat> For many of us, this runs really deep. For some of us who've maybe recently joined the church, don't have a church background, you might have heard that word, but you might not really know what it means, and that's okay. Hopefully you will a bit by the end of this message. I think we can have a superficial understanding sometimes of what it means to be Pentecostal. It's more than just singing songs by Hillsong or Elevation Worship. It's more than just having a worship band. It's more than just putting your arms in the air. That's all part of it, but it's not the essence of what it is to be Pentecostal. To be Pentecostal is to believe that there's an experience to be received after conversion called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. All Christians receive the Holy Spirit at their conversion because the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. He reveals Jesus to us. <coughs> the Bible says without the Spirit we can't even say Jesus is Lord and mean it truthfully. So all Christians have the Holy Spirit in them. Don't misunderstand me. But to be effective witnesses, to be effective in mission, to be effective in evangelism, there's an experience of the Holy Spirit coming on somebody. So to put that into concise words, the Holy Spirit comes within you for you to enable you to become a Christian. But the Holy Spirit comes on you for other people to make you a witness. Can we get that distinction? It's really important. We see it on the day of Pentecost. 120 disciples in an upper room. This is after Jesus had ascended to heaven. They were believers. I think we can all agree they believed in Jesus at that moment in time. But they were fearful. They were fearful of the threat of death. So they sat in a locked room praying for 50 days until the Holy Spirit came. And suddenly, these men and women, Mary was there, rushed out into the streets declaring the glory of God in unlearned languages. People were saying, what is this? And Peter said, I'll tell you, it's this. And he preached a sermon and 3,000 were converted. Change men. That's what we stand for, friends. That's why I'm passionate about this message. Because without the Holy Spirit, we are not going to be effective. You might have a glorious Christian life personally, but you're not, not going to reach out and and the surrounding areas. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit. The Pentecostal church leads the world, the Christian world, in adult conversions. It's the fastest growing Christian movement. There are 35,000 conversions in Pentecostal churches every day. 600 million Pentecostals worldwide. To put that in perspective, the population of the UK is about 67 million. Friends, there were none in 1900. In just over a hundred years, zero to six hundred million. That's good growth, isn't it? But why should we be surprised? Because this is what the baptism in the Holy Spirit is for. To make us effective at sharing the good news of Jesus. The Holy Spirit takes us from being a monument, as unfortunately many churches are, and it transforms us into a movement that takes ground and pushes back the gates of hell. To quote from the Assemblies of God's Statement of Faith, we believe that the essential biblical evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is the speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. Friends, I don't know if you've ever looked at this before, but if you read the book of Acts, every time the Holy Spirit is given, it either specifically says people spoke in tongues, or they spoke in tongues and prophesied, or 
there was some outward manifestation of something. Because in Acts 8, Simon the sorcerer, so an unbeliever, a demonic person, he saw the apostles lay hands on people and they received the Holy Spirit. And he wanted to buy the power to do that to people. It wasn't just this invisible, I've received the Holy Spirit. He saw, he heard something. He knew it was powerful and he wanted to replicate it, which of course you can't. I'm very confident he witnessed speaking in tongues. Friends, it was hearing speaking in tongues for me as a lad of 13 years old on a Sunday morning that gripped my heart. I thought, whoa, that's different. God's alive there. God's here. And I came, I remember Anne Taylor, sorry, I didn't mean to say this, but I'll say it anyway. And um, I said to my nana, will you be coming tonight then? And my nana said, oh, he's up school tomorrow. I'm not sure. I said, I'm coming. I'm coming tonight. And I kept coming, and I kept coming, and I kept coming. And I'm still coming. Not that it's all about tongues. It glorifies Jesus. But it, it, it interested me straight away. It was a book. So I've not got much time to go into the theology of tongues, but just a few points. Tongues aren't gibberish. They're real human languages, which have either been spoken in the past, or spoken now in the world somewhere, or will be spoken in the future. The languages aren't supernatural. It's the ability to speak them without learning them. That's supernatural. And Elizabeth has spoken of speaking in Zulu in South Africa. It's an earthly language. But the fact she hadn't learnt it is pretty supernatural. Speaking in tongues builds us up. The Apostle Paul says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Edifies means builds up, strengthens. It's an act of faith. Sometimes you don't feel anything. And that's okay. Sometimes you do. And that's glorious. But scripture's clear. If you pray in tongues, you are making your inner man or woman stronger. We either believe the scripture or we don't. But Paul says we do, so I'm going with that. The Apostle Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. Right into the Corinthians. I remember Andrew Sherman some years ago saying that he's, he's made a deal with the Lord, so to speak. It says, Lord, would you time how long I speak in tongues? Because I want to overtake Paul's record. <laughs> I don't know how I was going with that, but it's a noble ambition. Friends, is it any wonder that Paul accomplished all that he did? He wrote half the New Testament, took the gospel around Europe. He spoke in tongues more than anybody. That's a good record. When we speak in tongues, our spirits pray. Paul said, I will pray with my spirit, meaning in tongues. I will also pray with my understanding, in my native language. Notice it's not the Holy Spirit praying. It's your spirit praying, enabled by the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's a blessed thing, you know, to pray. When you don't know how to pray. And let's face it, sometimes we're all there. Just to yield to God and speak. Unlearned languages, knowing that you're connecting with God in a very intimate, personal way. The baptism of the Spirit is the gateway into operating in other gifts of the Spirit. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, tongues and interpretation of tongues. And I love this subject. I've not got time to go into it today, but maybe another time. Dr. David Betts, some of us heard him at Mattersey a few months ago, former principal of Mattersey Bible College, he wrote a book called Body Builders, all about the gifts of the Spirit, because that's what they're for. That when they're used, as they were this morning, it builds up the body of Christ. It brings comfort. It brings strength. It brings inspiration. The gifts of the Spirit are body builders. We should use them all the more. So friends, this church has always stood for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. These are considered mainstream Christian beliefs now, but they weren't, you know, when this church was started. According to Betty Smith, who I miss dearly, as I'm sure we all do, people in Hamburg tried to get this church shut down when it started, but the council were in favour of the church. 
Pentecostals were religious fanatics. They were the extremists, the loony fringe of Christianity. Maybe sometimes we still are, but there we are. But the point is now, we are mainstream. We're invited to the table with our other evangelical brethren. People recognise that we've got something to offer. The amount of community, voluntary work done by Pentecostal churches in this country is incredible. And so as I draw this section to a close, I've got to ask, have you been baptised in the Holy Spirit? Paul asks the same question to the Ephesian believers, believers in Acts 19. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? And straight away that tells me, he expected them to know. So the Christians will say, well, it's just the same as being born again. Well, no, as Paul said, did you receive this when you believed? Meaning you either could or you couldn't. It's a conscious, unmistakable experience. The believers said, actually, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. So Paul said, okay, laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came, they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. And so, friends, if you've not received the Holy Spirit, the good news is that you can. You can. It's not for some elite group of Christians. It's not for this minority. This is what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. The promise of the Spirit is for you and your children and all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God would call. We're afar off, aren't we, by some 2,000 years? But that's us. That excites me. This is for me. It's for you. The Lord expects us to attain a certain level of holiness before we will baptise in the Spirit. It's a gift, like salvation. He just wants us to be hungry. According to Jesus' logic, if we ask for bread, we get bread. If we ask for a stone, we get a stone. No, we don't. What answers the poison? Fish. Yeah, there we are. Um, if we ask for the Holy Spirit, we get the Holy Spirit. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's, who's not a charismatic Christian. I think he's interested, but he's just scared of getting it wrong. I said, well, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, you get Holy Spirit, surely. We need to be more confident in his willingness to give and in our ability to be deceived. On a practical level, the biblical norm is for the Spirit to be received through the laying on of hands. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, but myself and others will be more than happy to pray with you, to receive the Holy Spirit. If, if you know this is you, go for it. Don't hold back any longer. For those who've been baptised in the Spirit, is it an ongoing reality in your life? Or is it just a, a blessed memory? We need to examine ourselves and be honest. Paul said, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's an ongoing experience. We've got to remain continuously yielded so the Lord can keep pouring in. See, as we keep moving forward, let's not be Pentecostal in name only. And thank God we're not. We saw that this morning. Some churches might have AOG over the door, but the glory has departed. Unfortunately, often that's through lack of teaching on the baptism of the Spirit, or becoming too professional and too slick, such that there's no opportunity for anything spontaneous to happen, and general apathy among the congregation. Friends, let's fan into flame the gift of God. If he used to give messages in tongues years ago, what stopped you? If he used to prophesy regularly, he was still to your tongue. Because you've still got Holy Spirit. We just need to stir ourselves up a little bit sometimes. We need to take responsibility for it. Can you imagine if we all came to church and on the way we said, Lord, uh, I'm yours today. Please use me in any way you want in the meeting. If we all did that, can you imagine how our meetings would take off? How it would go to a new level? If it just wait for the people doing the official things to lead us through everything. If we all contribute something, it will be far, far more exciting. Let's go for it. So, number three, 
missional. And I guess this really links in with, with being Pentecostal, because we said that the fruit of being Pentecostal is to be missional, by definition. ALCC has always had a heart to reach our wood and the surrounding areas with the good news of Jesus. We've never been an insular community. We've always been out looking. And in the 80 plus years of this church being here, we've made numerous links in the local community. These are just the ones that we are currently doing. Little munchkins, creating a safe and stimulating environment for, for young children and parents and grandparents to come, make social connections and, and chat to Christian people. Dynamite, of course, where teenagers can have a safe place to come. Again, have that social interaction that's so often lacking. To make friends, to come under the sound of Christian influence. Connect meetings, by the way, next Sunday evening, 5.30, our next connect, connect meeting. Connect serves as a, a service tailored for non-Christians, really. Just to kind of be another entry point, another point of access for them to come into the main life of the church. And our Alcoholics Anonymous group uses our building too. It's not a church event, but it's a good and a godly work that we're happy to facilitate. I think being missional is, of course, the food bank, living home, the charity shop. An amazing outreach. Being missional is a key strength of our church. So it's a matter of just keep on doing what we're doing. But I would just like to emphasise this. We need to make the most of every opportunity to create access for others to our amazing God. Is there anything in our building, in the language we use, in the way that we do services, that might create unnecessary or confusing barriers for people who come in? You see, we're all so familiar with Christian language, aren't we? I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I've been saved by the line of the tribe of Judah. Glorious. But well, friends, a life should teach your students who've not even heard of Jesus. Seriously. We just need to be mindful that people haven't got much reference points that they would have had decades ago. To what extent is our church accessible for those who come in for the first time with no church background? Because to be truly missional is to talk in the language of the people you're trying to reach. Missionaries used to learn the language. Hudson Taylor went to China clothed himself as a Chinese man. He was from Yorkshire. He ingrained himself with the culture to make that connection. Paul said, I've become all things to all men, that by all means we might save some. So friends, when changes in church come, and they will come, we need changes, don't we? It's healthy to change. Bear in mind what the intention will be. It won't be for the sake of change. I can promise you that. It'll be for the sake of mission. For the sake of reaching people more effectively. Removing unnecessary barriers which might make it harder for people to access church. Remember it's the bones of Joseph that need to move forward. We are not going to compromise on that ever. But other things, little things, like we said, it's not an essential. It's up for negotiation. It's got to be. Otherwise, we make traditions be equal with scripture. I'm just going to close this section with a quote from Charles Darwin. I appreciate he's probably never been quoted in a pulpit in this church before. But this observation of life, I think, is, is true. He said, it's not the strongest, nor the most intelligent of species that survives, but the one that is most adaptable to change. Friends, I get that we don't like change. We're creatures of habit, aren't we? I think this church has done an amazing job in, in moving forward into the 21st century. And PJ won't like me for this, but I'm going to honour him. And I'd like us to honour PJ now, make him blush. Because he got the church online, he got the church on social media, he got the live stream going from nothing. And friends, that's a massive step forward. And people are coming like Elisha's cousin driving from Mosbury and Sheffield to come here because he saw it online. Thank you, PJ, we honour you. It's important to honour people. 
Let's stay missional minded. Let's not be driven by comfort or preferences. Do you remember Peter's brilliant message on the parable of the prodigal son? It might be your fattened calf that gets killed so the lost sons can come in. We don't like that, do we? That's my thing. That's the thing that I really like. But friends, some things are, are going to have to be killed so that the lost son can come back in and stay. People come in quite regularly, but we need more people to stay, don't we? Are we prepared for that to happen? Are we prepared to lose our fattened calves? Are we prepared to lay down our comforts and our preferences for a greater cause? The next point, inclusive. ALCC has always been a place where anybody, no matter who they are, where they've come from, how they dress, what they sound like, what they look like, they are made welcome and they are given a brilliant welcome. Again, Louis testified that someone hooked him, a lady hooked him, he said, and it touched him. And friends, I've said it before, it reminded me of Margaret Lloyd hugging me as a boy. No experience of church culture. That was the normal thing to do for Margaret. But for me, it was everything. It changed my life. Friends, let's not forget what is normal to us is not normal to this world. We live in a world that's so individualized, where community is so fragmented. People are crying out for meaningful relationships, real community, real conversations not based around alcohol or nonsense. Church offers community. It offers family, actually. That's even better. It offers love and acceptance. It offers opportunities to build relationships that are deep and even life-lasting. May we never lose sight of this. May we never give way to cliques. May we never just become indifferent to people who come in. Has anyone seen the Jesus Revolution film that came out this year? Anybody? Yeah. Yes. Anybody else? Well, I should ask who's there with me. It's a great film, and I think actually it would be wonderful to watch it as a church. I don't know how we could do that, but it's so powerful and so encouraging. So it's set in the late 1960s in California, and there's a conservative pastor of a small church, quite traditional, evangelical, but traditional. And this hippie preacher comes in, long hair, flamboyant clothes, barefoot, talking really casually, but he loves Jesus. And the preacher's like encouraged, but I'm not sure how you're going to fit in here. But anyway, this hippie preacher brings in all of his other hippie friends, and, and they just descend on the church. And the church is like, what on earth is this? The pastor was really encouraged because even though he challenged him, he knew God was at work. And then the elders called a meeting, and this is true by the way, called a meeting with the pastor and said, we're concerned about the carpet, all the oils on their feet, that is damaging the plush carpet. Can you either tell them to put shoes on or send them to another church? I'm serious, it sounds funny to us friends. But the pastor, I, I think Jesus would have done this, it's so ingenious. The next Sunday they didn't have a mandatory shoe policy. They didn't send them to another church. He met them at the door and one by one. They washed their feet. Cool. Powerful. You see those young hippies in the 60s and 70s that were seeking truth. Their generation looked different to the parents' generation. They wanted God, but friends, if the church hadn't accommodated them, hadn't loved on them as they were, they never would have met him, would they? No. They might have done that at a different church, but they wouldn't have met him there. It makes me think of the young people of today, a very different generation to the young people of the 60s. Mm -hmm. The temptations of that generation, sex, drugs and rock and roll. The young people today, and I'm generalising, so hear me here, because there are exceptions obviously, but young people today socialise less in person. 
They're actually drinking smoke less than any other generation before. High frequency of mental health problems. Not much optimism for the future. Again, I was in there in the 60s, obviously, but I sense that there was a, a sense of things are getting better. Whereas today, it's things are going down. Friends, how are we going to welcome these people into church? Are we going to dictate that they mold to fit us? Or are we going to meet them in the middle, like Chuck Smith, the pastor of that church, did? It's challenging, of course it is. But this is mission, this is being inclusive. Chuck Smith could have kept his tidy and dignified services going without disruption. He had a congregation of 25 people in 1965. Now, his church extends to a thousand churches in America. Some of which are the largest in the United States. The Lord honoured Smith's willingness to rethink church. To be more accommodating to people who look different to him. I love this quote from Proverbs. Where no oxen are, the trough is clean. But increase comes by the strength of an ox. I seem to remember Paul preaching on that years ago. Let's resist the temptation of having a clean trough. But not having fresh oxen. We want more oxen here, don't we? More strength. More man and woman power. More resources. Well, friends, we need to allow it a mess. We need to walk with people as they come in and untangle them from all the issues that the world has put on them. But let's respond in the spirit of Christ with grace and patience and genuine love. See, only the Lord can bring the dead to life. The Lord raised Lazarus. But he said to the disciples, you take over now. You take them Stinking grave clothes off. And friends, we need to do a bit of that. And we hope we do do that very well, actually, at ALCC. Patiently taking off layer upon layer that the world and the devil and all kinds of things have put on people. The Lord saves people. And then he hands them to us, so to speak, working through us, to then just love them back to life again and walk with them on the journey. Number five, the last one. Pioneering. ALCC has always been a church that's dreamed big dreams in God. One that's set ambitious goals and put in the hard graft to bring them about. You see, friends, this church didn't begin in a big revival campaign. It began with a handful of Pentecostal believers meeting in a bedroom on Mornington Road. <coughs> but they had a vision for more than that. They could have said, oh, these are glorious meetings. But they wanted more. These were working class people. These were mining families. But they, they, they started saving money. And they, ten years later, they bought this land from the Cold War, 1949. I have no doubt, friends, that the widow's might situation went on here. That some people put in all they had. Again, the bones of Joseph. Not thinking for my needs now. But they were looking ahead in faith, beyond their own lifetime. And we're still here because of their faithfulness. A former doctor's surgery was transplanted from Dole onto this site. That was the first church building. They could finally use instruments without annoying the neighbours. But you see, Pastor George Smith, who pioneered this church, he wanted more. He had a vision for more. He wrote in his diary, actually, he was disappointed how small the building was. It was a second-hand building. Already, its days were numbered. And so we started saving again. And 16 years later, they built the present building. State of the art in the 1960s. Much bigger. And the Lord began to fill it. Pastor Roy Smith took over the work when his dad died. He was determined that the church would embrace the fresh move of the Spirit. The church was packed. The L shape was packed, these panels were taken away, people were on the balcony, people had to get here early to get a seat. The meetings were free, but it, it came at a cost, you know. Roy's family, his sister and brother, who had been there from the beginning, they didn't like it. They wanted it a bit more traditional Pentecostal, shall we say. And they left 
and it caused significant pain to Roy and Betty. But they counted the cost and they set their face like flint and they kept going. Amen. Thank God they did. Amen. Pastor John Ford brought in the work when he took it on in 1990. His time here saw increased cooperation with the churches, involvement in mission in Romania. He expanded the leadership team with Andy Rushworth as assistant pastor. He was instrumental in bringing the Toronto blessing here. Again, fresh new spirit brought renewal and fresh expectation. Under pastors Paul and talking, the church transitioned from being a village church to being a church for the region, hence the name change, Abundant Life Christian Centre. Mission links with India were established, which continue to this day. The Living Hope Project was set up from scratch. The move of the spirit, again, continually being sought. I came here in 2008. The Lakeland outpouring was happening in America. Paul and Toki went to that. The fire came back to Dudley, and there were nightly meetings for many, many weeks. And many of us went down there and had incredible times in the presence of God. And friends, I am so grateful that that was my first experience of Christianity. It was never about the church organization. From day one, it was about the presence of God, knowing him personally, having your life changed, believing that anything can happen in a meeting. That's my foundation. Paul had a commitment to body ministry. He gave people opportunities in the pulpit to develop their giftings. I'm grateful he saw something in me and let me have a go when I was 15. And we do honour Paul, and we honour you, Tucky, as well. I've just picked out a few big events there. I've seen lots of other fantastic things have happened in all of those areas. So why do I say all of that? Because we're not living in the past. It's important to remember and learn and honour. Yeah. But we're here today, aren't we? And we look into the future. Yeah. So what is it that we're believing for as a church today? What are we working towards? What are we sowing towards? The Bible says without vision, the people perish. Without vision, we'll keep things going, but they'll eventually peter out. Without vision, we won't take ground, we won't advance, we won't add to the work of God. But the opposite is also true. With vision, we will take ground. With vision, we will move forward. With vision, we will see an increase of the work of God here at ALCC. In terms of vision, I'll just quote from the last Trustees annual report, obviously this was written before I returned here. The church council is maintaining planning for the long-term future of the church, seeking to train, develop, and introduce new leaders and volunteers drawn from the membership, whilst also being committed to succession planning and the preparation for the recruitment of a full or part-time paid leader at some future point. This kind of comes before me, but I say a big amen to that. It needs to happen. We need to have the means to employ somebody, either full-time or part-time. As associate leader, I work full-time. I work in a job, as Jackie knows, uh, that encroaches significantly into my personal time. I do what I can because I, I care, I believe. You know, I believe I've got things to do here. But there's a bigger plan than that. We need the increased capacity that only a paid worker can bring. Something the leadership's currently working on is how we can make giving easier. Elizabeth's looking to change the church bank account so people can set up standing orders. Well, I should have a checkbook. You know, we, we do all our money electronically, so our tides are just sitting waiting until we can have a standing order set up. We need to make it easier to give. I think we need to make giving a more central aspect of our services too. Maybe not the add-on at the end. We, we shouldn't be ashamed of giving people an opportunity to give. Because we're not putting anyone under compulsion. It's a privilege to be able to give. It's part of our worship. We need to signpost the opportunity to give more effectively and increase the options of how people can give. And of course we need to increase the membership of the church which in turn will increase the finances. I know it sounds a bit not spiritual, 
talking like this. But this is reality, friends. We need to be practical and spiritual, don't we? We need to make the church appealing to younger generations, young professionals, people who are willing to sow their time and their money and their skill set into the place. Church branding and marketing is important. Again, I understand that sounds unspiritual. But the reality is, friends, people are willing to drive some way to go to a church that, that fits well with them. They will drive by some other AOG churches that don't quite fit right with them to get to the one. They didn't used to be that way. We go to the nearest one. It's a different world. It's a marketplace. When people check out churches on Facebook and on the internet before they actually turn up, it's the way of the, way of the world. And to be honest, Pentecost has always been good with that advertising and branding and things like that. Again, rethinking, thinking outside the box. It's not everything, but it's important. So friends, we are entering a season of pioneering. A season of reaching for the next chapter in our wonderful church's history. It's nothing new. Pioneering and dreaming big dreams have always been part of this church's DNA. But we can't afford to fall for this. To leave this bone behind in Egypt, so to speak. Let's catch the vision. Let's work towards this common goal. Our generation currently holds the baton that's been passed down faithfully from generation to generation. And that great cloud of witness are cheering us on. Friends, I want to run well, not you. Yeah. We want to run well, don't we? When we come to the end of our days, we can say, I ran as far as I could with that. And I've passed it on with a smooth transition. Elisha and I were at the AOG GB Central Conference in 2019 and I wrote this down in my notes. It was said, the best way to honour the past is to move forwards. It's true, isn't it? I love the past. That's kind of in my DNA, I think. But I know we need to move forward. Can I just ask Bronwyn to come and like play? I know it's not been a normal message today. I was quite nervous. I mean, I'm always a bit nervous anyway, because I, I take it very seriously, bringing the word of God. But it's, I feel I've kind of summarised who we are. This is our mandate. This is our, our high calling. I've not preached anything like it before. Friends, exciting times are ahead of us. And I don't say that superficially. I'm not about how I'm about believing. I believe God's at work amongst us and the future of ALCC is bright. But we need to partner with the Lord to help realise this future that we're dreaming of. There are actions that we need to take that feed into the bigger picture. Friends, let's commit ourselves to God afresh this morning. If you could, could you stand with me? Let's do business with God this morning while we're all together. I'm going to pray along the lines of what we've said this morning. And I'm going to open it up to the church to pray as well, to pray publicly. Not tiny religious prayers, but a heart cry. Because I know we love this church, as I do. Call out to God for the future of ALCC. Call out to God for wisdom for us because we need it. Call out to God for courage to make changes in how we do things for the long term future of the church. Call out to God for increased finances so a paid worker can be sold. Call out to God that He will move powerfully in our midst, saving souls and transforming lives. So I'll just pray. And I'll open up to the room. I encourage you to get involved. I know not everyone will have time to pray. But if you feel a spirit and you want to, go for it. I feel it's a significant day for the church we understand. Father, we thank you for your glorious word, which always brings faith 
always, always encourages and brings hope. And Lord, we thank you for this holy place, the ALCC, the people, the building, all that we stand for, all that's been achieved, all the lives that have been changed in this place over 80 years. But Lord, we look ahead. We thank you for the past, but we look ahead. Yes. Lord, we want this church to be here for 80 more years and the rest. But we know Lord, we have our part to play. Lord, would you help us? Would you help us to be faithful? Would you help us, Lord, to dream again? To lay aside unbelief and comfort and preferences and cynicism. We want to believe again, Lord, that we will see your work revived in our day, that we will see great things in our day, that the glory of the latter temple will be greater than the glory of the former. God, we want to believe it. Oh God, hear our prayer this morning. Hear our heart cry. Lead us, Lord, for you know the way. You are the way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just encourage you to pray, church. Be the church. Call out to God. Thank you, Father, that we are where we are because you have made us for such a time as this. And as we are here in the present, Lord, 
We ask you to pour out your spirit yes. afresh on us. Pour out your spirit. Come and rest in us like never before as we walk forward in the power and the might of our Jesus Christ. As we learn to stand on that rock, Lord, you will take us and transform us into men and women that will not just change this region, but will change this country and change this world so that people will see you and your glory and your might. But most of all, Lord, they will experience your love. Lord, arise us up. Rise us up into that harvest field. Rise us up into that harvest field, Lord. Give us a boldness for you. Give us a trust and a faith and a belief in you like never before, Lord, so that we can draw all men unto you, Lord. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work you're going to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work you are doing. Draw us closer to you, Jesus. Draw us closer to you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you said that if we lift you up, you would draw all men to you. And Lord, we... We want to be relevant, Lord. We want to be the people that you want us to be. As we lift you up, Lord, to draw men, that you will draw men to you. Sharon us pray, Lord. We, we are interested in souls and we know who you are, Lord. We're interested in the lost and we, our hearts sometimes break, Lord, when we see and hear of the things that are taking place. Lord, we do thank you that you are building your church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You said that. Lord. We thank you, Father, that you're still here. And Lord, we we are available, Lord. And we want to be relevant. Lord, you've given us gifts, Father. Help us, Lord, to just spare those gifts that are within us, Lord. So of us, Lord, have allowed them to be dormant and ineffective. And we pray and forgive us. Help us, Lord, to stir those gifts that are within us, each individual and as a body. Father, in Jesus' name, Amen. Father God, you've always had this church in the palm of your hands. You've always watched over us. You've always led us. You've always guided us. But Father, I thank you that this church stands for the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Word of God. Father, we've never compromised. The Word is the Word. The Word is true. Father, and people down the years have not liked it, Lord, because I've been coming to this church a long time. But Lord, you've stood faithful. You've blessed this church. You've brought us through. And Father God, you'll bring us through again. Father, you've got great plans in store for us for the future. And Father, all of us want to be a part of it, Lord. Father, lead us by your Holy Spirit. Lead us through your word. Father, I've seen this church go through many, many valleys. There's been two or three splits down the years. And it's all it's rocked the boat in this church. But your divine hand is always been upon us as a body, as a congregation, as a family. Father, how much more will you take us through to our future? Father, we thank you for today. We want to be blessed tomorrow, next week and forever. Because Father, your word never changes. You never change. You are a faithful God. You've been faithful down the years. You've brought us through many difficulties. You'll bring us through much more difficulties as we go through to our future. Father, it might be unsettled. It might be a bit fearful. And no, I don't like change. I spoke about it on Friday at the prayer meeting when I heard from Toki that change is coming and you've got to get used to it. Father, I don't want to be on the fence. I want to be involved 
I know, Father, you're going to use me greatly and mighty, and I want to be used like everybody else in this congregation. So, Father, stir my heart, stir my spirit. It might be a little bit fearful, as, Father, you take us out of our comfort zone. You're going to take this church out of its comfort zone. You're going to rock the nest which is under, under us, sheltering us. You want us to fly. You want us to go higher. You've got plans, Lord, great plans, future, Lord, for this church, for this village, Father, for the surrounding district. Father, everything you've prophesied over this church will come to pass because your word is true. Your word brings freedom and liberty. Freedom and liberty shall come in this place and we will see the harvest come in because we desire it, Lord. We pray for it, Lord. We stood faithfully on your word, Lord. And through our faithfulness, God said, I will bless you. I will bless you abundantly because you have been faithful. You've stood through difficult situations, but you've stood. You kept coming, you kept praying, you kept believing. You stood on my word, you have spoken my word. And through that, God said, I shall be faithful to you. God is going to be faithful to this fellowship, to us as individuals, to us as a fellowship and a congregation. And you will take us further <coughs> on because he's got so much more for us to do. So we can reach, Father, those who are outside the kingdom. We can reach our wood and the surrounding districts, Lord. And Father, it's going to be through the power of the mighty Holy Ghost. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, that these things will take place. So this is a new day. This is a new beginning, a new day for all of us, for us a church, Lord. A new day, a new season. Get excited, church. Get excited. God's going to do tremendously exciting things and he wants you to be involved all of us to be involved. So I thank you, God, for what you're going to do. I thank you, Lord. This is a new day, a new season. And I thank you. It's exciting days ahead. The best is yet to come. I believe it, Lord, with all my heart. I give you all the praise and all the glory for what you're going to do, Lord, in this place. And in our lives, Lord, you're going to do tremendous things in our lives. You're going to stir our spirit. You're going to rekindle the flame within us again, Lord. We're going to see visions. We're going to have dreams, Lord. We're going to prophesy. We're going to pray for the sick, Lord. We're going to see salvation. We're going to see healing and deliverance shall come to many, many people, Lord. Because that's your desire and that's our desire too, Lord. So we give you all the praise and all the glory, Father. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. During the praise and worship, God gave me a picture. And I didn't speak it out. I thought, I'm just going to think on it, but I'm going to speak it out now. And I want to speak, firstly, to the leaders of this church. And I want to speak to those that make decisions for this church. I want to speak to every departmental person that leads in different departments. And I want to speak to every congregation member. I see this church teetering on the edge of a cliff. Teetering. Just, and that's why I didn't speak it out because I thought, oh Lord, that's doesn't sound very good to me. Are we about to fall? Are we is something happening? Or what's going on? And it really upset me right through the meeting. I thought, Lord, I tried to say something. Yes, he is. As so we look back and we're standing on that cliff edge, it's solid. It's been good. And Ben laid it out this morning. But in front of us, is the unknown. In front of us, it can be scary and we want to backtrack and have our feet on solid ground. But 
right now God is saying it's not time for that. It's a solid foundation deep within each one of us. But as we look, we don't know what the future holds. It's a blank sheet. And it's from dizzy height that we're looking into the future. But God is saying, on the backs, on our backs is a parachute. And God wants to encourage you this morning to take a leap of faith. It's going to go against the grain of many. But know that you've got the wind of the Spirit in your sheet. And He will take us where He wants. If we bend the knee and submit, change is not easy. But I come from a background of looking to the future. And I want each one of you to grasp that this church is going to go places. We're not a village church. We happen to be placed in a village. And we love Owenwood. But our field is much further than that. Our harvest is much bigger than we can think of at this time. And so when change comes and it rattles us, know that we've got the wind of the Spirit. And I trust our leaders and those that make decisions. And sometimes it's going to go against the grain. But please, please trust in the Lord. He's in control by His Spirit in this church. Help us be sensitive to what He's saying and what He wants for our future. And I know there's something great out there for us. I just know it. And we are going to see the unlovely coming. But if you ever caught a fish that you haven't had to gut and scale, the fish are going to come in and they're going to come in ugly. And they're going to come in with scales on them. And their guts are still going to be within them. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, we will descale, we will be there, and we're going to see fishes of men arise amongst us. But I'm asking you this morning to please stay pliable. God's got something great for this church. Amen. Share this either because it's that weird to me when I heard the Lord say it. I see said two words, walking Bibles. I said, I've never seen a Bible walk. And he says, Now that the members of this congregation are going to be so ingrained in the word that they will become walking Bibles and walk solid in his firm foundation of his word. That they'll walk in with the word, they'll walk out with the word, the word, they'll go into the communities with the word. So is well, whenever you start reading the Bible from this day forth, the Lord is going to ingrain it so deep within you that what Toki's just shared, it won't shake us because we're so ingrained in His Word, in His plans for the future of this church. So we're a walking Bible. We're going to become walking ingrained in God's Word that we won't be unshakable because of what He's done in us. morning, God spoke say, in various ways to various people. A lot's been said, and you don't have to catch everything, but treasure those things in your heart that you've heard and have resonated with your spirit. Maybe even watch the live stream back and just get a few things written down. It's a significant day, and, and as Toki said, we're on a threshold point. We can go one way or another in church, but I trust that we're going to go in the right direction. It might not always be easy, but we are planning for the future. Okay. Carol, do you want to come from? Okay. Speak back then. Yeah, I just felt the Lord say, with everything that's happening, with everything that's going to happen, 
I feel the Lord saying to us to guard our hearts, to guard our minds, and to guard the unity. Because yeah. in Psalm 133, is it? Where brethren dwell together in unity, I'm not saying there's not any unity here, it's guarding it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you know. Guard that unity, guard the mind. And where God commands a blessing, where unity is, God will command that blessing. Yeah. Can you just imagine what blessings are going to be as we guard our unity, where we dwell together in unity? God is going to command the blessing. He's told us, He's going to restore the backsliders. We're, we're praying for backsliders, we're expecting them to come in. And our latter days are going to be greater than our former days. I'm excited. Did you want to close the meeting? Did you want to close the meeting? I've got an exceptional message. Um, yeah, so we're just going to close the meeting. So on Saturday is field chat at half past ten. Is it going to be in this room? Yeah. Yeah, because we're doing it down there. Oh, this was the room. Yeah. Yeah, and then is there anything going on on Wednesday? Yeah. Soon Graham. Soon Graham, is that 6.30? No, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock, Soon Graham. And then don't forget, a week. Next yeah. Sunday is connected to half past five. Um, it's the cut off, so let me all know if you're going to be there for, you know, catering reasons. Um, but yeah, everybody's welcome, and I think that's it. Yeah. And the offering. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I just say about connect? Anyone is welcome. Anyone is welcome. You can come, but if you want to chat with family, you need to put. You need that. Okay. You need to know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.